Hi, today I thought I'd address a few of the comments people have made about both the Jupiter XM and the Cobalt 8 as they sort of answer the questions about each other. Because when reviewing the Cobalt 8, people asked why doesn't anyone make multi-timbral synths anymore? And when looking at the XM, people have commented about the interface. And I guess you can't have everything in a single package. The two things just don't mix complexity and ease of use or do they or you know or could they one costs around 600 pounds and the other costs almost twice as much at just under 1200 pound so first of all let's just do a quick overview of what they both are the Jupiter XM is multi-timbral it's 256 voice polyphonic and can play four individual tracks each containing a different tone so you can stack the tracks you can split the keyboard or you could have four separate MIDI tracks or playing different things obviously each track has got its own effects and can use a selection of amazingly flexible synth engines all based on their Zencore technology which means you can swap patches between a lot of their synths like the Phantom and the Axe Edge and the MC 101 anything that uses their Xenology Pro software which also comes as a plugin as well. Plus it's got a rhythm track and a selection of over 70, I think it is, drum machines or drum patches with the sound spread across the full width of the keyboard. So it's got in there 808s, 909s, 707s, 606s and stuff like that. And there's absolutely no doubt about the quality of the tones you can get from this. It's got sounds from their high-end RD piano range and from the XV5080. So all superb professional quality and can give amazingly realistic recreations of orchestral instruments. Plus, it's also got emulations of some of their classic analogues, like the Jupiter 8, the Jupiter 106, the JXAP, and the SH-101. And as with everything on the XM, the effects are really flexible with loads of different algorithms, some based on classic units. They tend to stay within the sensible and lush category rather than straying into special effects territory. There are no huge feedback delays, for example, unlike the Cobalt, which can stray a bit more towards the experimental. The Cobalt sound engine is limited in comparison to just eight voices, but each of those voices can have effectively up to eight oscillators, so it's not as simple as it first sounds, and that depends on the selected algorithm. So it can sound much larger than a standard two oscillator polysynth. Watch my review to get more details on this, I'll leave a link in the comments. But you've got two oscillators that use algorithms to give complex tones as the starting point, which can each replicate the sound of four separate oscillators. So the big, the rich, and the complex. So this is a single oscillator.
again, it's got a selection of really nice sounding effects. But this is much more like an old school poly in that you have a single tone and access to all of the major functions through the front panel. Moving back to the XM then, and this is where the conflict between functionality and convenience comes into play. It's got a really knobby interface and most of the quick access things you'd use to tweak a tone are all available from the front panel. We have the filter, the filter type and the main filter parameters. There's the LFO section down here as well as access to the envelope share between these controls here. But for deep editing, you're gonna have to do a bit of menu diving and with the five different voices, you can sometimes get lost wondering which mode you're in. So to edit the set, which is the combination of everything, we press this. To edit the individual patches, we hit this. And to choose the synth engine, you hit this. Then to edit the oscillators, you press the function button. And these lights now indicate which oscillator you're listening to or editing, rather than which tone you're listening to or editing. So with all these sort of different tiers, it's inevitable that it can be confusing, but it does give you access to absolutely everything in here. And when you look at quite how much they've squeezed into this, you have to admit it's pretty impressive. This is the Xenology Pro software, which is essentially exactly the same engine. And all these parameters that we're looking at here can be edited on the XM directly through the interface or through a little bit of menu diving. <laughs> but when I, when I say a little bit, there are an awful lot of parameters. And if you want to do some really massively deep diving, you will have to get to know these menus a little bit better than I have. But there are some shortcuts using the shift key. On the Cobalt, on the other hand, pretty much everything is to hand. The interface is essentially double what you see here. Everything's got a sort of secondary function by pressing this shift button. And yes, that can be confusing as well when you've left the switch on and you've forgotten you've left it on and you start tweaking other things. But when designing sounds, you only really need the menu system for the modulation buses and for choosing effects. But it's inevitable that when something has less functionality, it's going to be easier to use. But this takes things a little bit further by having the oscillators that replicate the output of various functions like ring mod and sync and detuning and wave shaping, all accessed by a couple of knobs. But again, watch my review to see that in more detail. But it's basically the USP of this synth and what makes it different than standard virtual analogs. Here are some sounds then, and I've not tried to match them in any way at all. I've just played through some of the presets and found some nice little melodies. The sound engines in these are so different, there's no point in trying to match anything. But hopefully this can give a good overall impression of the type of tones they're capable of. And I have left the drum machine in on some of the presets for the Jupiter XM because it's what it can do. So not fair not to show what it can do compared to something I can't do it, I suppose. But yeah, just highlights how different they are. There's a reason it's twice the price. <laughs>
so they're both very nice in their own way there are of course larger versions of both of these so if you're a fan of full-size keyboards for an additional thousand pounds you get the jupiter x which is essentially an xm but in a much larger case with a better keybed and access to more controls like it's got a second envelope for example add 60 pounds to the cobalt and you get yourself a nice full-sized five octave keyboard and for 80 pound less you can get a desktop version and these have all got the same functionality they're just a different form factor but as far as questions regarding what's different about these sort of how have virtual analogs moved on since um novation supernova which was released back in 1998 i think and the axis virus i think the first virus was 1997 well i think that all comes down to the quality of the sounds and the effects. The Roland reminds me a little of my old JV2080 in the way in which sounds are created, but there's much more polyphony in the XM and again, much, much nicer effects. And although not multi-timbral, the Cobalt is a lot, lot cheaper than either of the older units, I think. The Axis Virus uh, still costs more than a brand new modal. So, um, it's an interesting question, but the slop and detune on the Cobalt, for example, can definitely give it a more vintage analogue sound than the virus can, for example. But all in all, for synth manufacturers making virtual analogues, there is definitely a question of what are they bringing that's new or innovative. Why ditch your old virtual analogue or why not pick up a used bargain? Well, I think one of the big things is integration with software and that's a definite must these days and the free editor on the cobalt bring it more up to date with android and ios apps as well as the apps for mac and pc it's a real shame i think that the xenology pro software doesn't come bundled with the xm because you are buying a bit of kit that uses that software so i don't know it just feels a bit bit like it'd be nice if you could be able to edit the xm using the Xenology Pro software and upload it directly to the machine and make things a lot easier make it a much more useful synth from, from my perspective anyway but then there's the Zenbeat software as well for the iPad and the iPhone uh, I've not tried them actually so don't know how well they integrate with the synths if they integrate with them at all but the Jupiter does have the iArpeggio that changes the sequence depending on how you're playing. Again, look at my review to see how that works. Um, and we really do have an extremely powerful synth in a small battery operated package with built-in speakers. And in the Cobalt, we have a genuinely interesting synth engine, again in a small package, but with a full size feel. So, I just thought I'd throw this together, put the two of them together, and you know, I've got the two of them in the studio at the same time, so so why not? It's, you know, I find it quite interesting, two different virtual analogs. I've got the um, Mini Log XD here as well. So that's another small synth, but again, this is, uh, this is analog, although it's got one digital oscillator actually, but um, I didn't compare with this because I thought they were a little bit different, but maybe I should. So maybe actually the more interesting question is, What's the difference between the Cobalt 8 and something like the Minilog XD? Because the prices are much similar than the um, than the XM and the Modal, which are sort of one's double the other, isn't it? But they are both, as I say, virtual analog, and people have been asking questions. Why can't we have multi-timbal? Well, you can. And why aren't they cheaper? Well, some are. <laughs> why can't we have full-size keys? Well, you can. So uh, I hope that was of some use to somebody somewhere. It was a bit of a different sort of um, experience for me. I'm not really digging into the keyboards at all here. But it was, um, it was quite interesting. And if you did find it interesting, maybe hit subscribe. And if you have subscribed already or you're quite fancy supporting the channel a little bit more, maybe take a look at my Patreon page where I've got some synth tutorials and demos sort of helping you to improve your programming skills. Anyway, as I say, I hope that was of some use to somebody somewhere and I'll see you next time.